so our first topic this afternoon will be type 2 diabetes and, in, and uh, Aboriginal peoples, Indigenous peoples, in, um, particularly in Canada. So uh, the, the first presentation is in several parts. The first will ad identify what the problem is. So a little bit of review about diabetes, a little bit of review about statistics, and then um, a review on some of the actions that are happening uh, in Canada around this. If you want a copy of the presentation, um, you can get in touch with Danielle afterwards, and I have a, uh, I have a copy that has the text on there uh, for you. Okay. So uh, as, as you may or may not know, I guess from the people in the room here, just a show of hands of, of, do people have a familiarity with type 2 diabetes? Just give me a show of hands. So you guys have studied this, so you, kinda, you know this stuff. Okay, good. So from an, an Aboriginal person or Abor the Aboriginal community's perspective, uh, what we're seeing here, and I, and I guess now, back in 1994 and in the 1990s, this was a new epidemic. Now in 2010, it's you know, over 15 years later. And so um, the epidemic has become old hat in a sense for our peoples and communities. And it is now being called an epidemic among the Canadian and American and, and Western populations. Uh, we certainly see it growing, not just in indigenous communities, but also seeing it in first generation immigrant communities. Uh, I believe the um, Hispanic community in London and the Asian community in Calgary in particular, there was two studies done, I may have them reversed, but first generation uh, people coming uh, in, in those particular, in those two places and numbers of diabetes appearing very, very quickly. Okay, uh, that, that was a couple of studies that were funded by the Lawson Foundation a few years ago. And what we're learning, and an interesting comment at this um, health conference back in the 1970s, and it, and it underlies the problem that we see in our communities, is that if we're calling this the new smallpox, it, it works very slowly. And the, uh, the piece there, one piece of fry bread at a time, uh, just goes to show how slow and how on a, uh, unconsciously and how insidiously I guess this disease does work because we don't even realize we haven't realized and I think even mainstream population today when we see the explosion in obesity not only among um, adults in North America but particularly among children you know it, th there's red lights flashing lights alarms going off and we just continue to go our merry little way to fast food, processed foods, unhealthy foods, quantity and things like that. Uh, yet we're faced with a very serious health problem with very, very serious and very expensive uh, consequences since the, our Western world is very oriented towards economy. So then we don't need to go through uh, this, you know, I should cover it up and ask you, and then we give you a grade and call back your professors about that. We know that it's a disease where the pancreas goes haywire. And what we teach in empowerment workshops and in diabetes prevention workshops uh, in my community is to get the message across is liking your body to an automobile, and the pancreas is one of the parts of the car that needs to run. And when it doesn't work right, you have car problems. And then everybody becomes aware. Oh, okay, I get it. The pancreas produces insulin. We need insulin to help convert all the food that we eat and drink that, that is energy, becomes energy, helps us with, th those are the keys that gets the energy into the cells. And something's wrong and we've all come home late at night, freezing cold, and we put the key in there and it doesn't work. And we have to jiggle and jiggle until it finally it turns. And when I use that analogy, people go, oh, yeah. Well, that's part of what diabetes is. Things are not working right. And, uh, and once we have it, we have it. Um, the days of, um, of uh, borderline diabetes are long gone. That's like saying you're a little bit pregnant. Uh, we have diabetes or we don't have diabetes. I live in a world of pre-diabetes myself for four years now. Um, and it still, from time to time, wakes you up. You wake up and kind of go, just what the heck is going on? 
you know, uh, particularly when it comes to what you're eating and drinking, uh, what kind of rest you're getting, the kind of lifestyle that you're living and the stresses that come with that, and certainly the amount of physical activity that you're engaged in. And sometimes everything just falls apart and you just kind of stand there scratching your head and you have to go back to square one. And that's, the, that's my life of living with diabetes in a pre-diabetes uh, stage. Uh, so that I can only imagine that people who have lived with diabetes and often uncontrolled diabetes for a number of years really struggle. Really struggle. And this then is what we see in our communities, whether it's First Nations uh, reserves or it's urban centers or it's Métis or Inuit communities. Uh, when we're talking with people, when diabetes is coming into their lives, even though it, everything seems to be all right, once complications and problems start, it gets to be a crisis and it affects the individual, family, the community, and ultimately our nations. So we know that what we cannot control is where we, who we are and where we come from. So our, you know, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the genealogy. Uh, the, um, the researchers that work with uh, Sandy Lake at Mount Sinai and University of Western Ontario, they isolated that thrifty gene among the people, the Ojikri, up in Sandy Lake. And then we're making, you know, the, uh, the, putting these theories together about this thrifty gene, which, you know, simply put, talks that our, our, when our people lived in a time of feast and famine, which wasn't that many generations ago when you live off the land, anybody around the world, when you live off the land, you live in a feast and famine existence. And so uh, you know at the end of winter season that food will be lean and that people may be going hungry and that the pancreas and this great, great automobile that we have called the human body, this great system that has all this magic and gift within it, uh, knows how to operate and knows when a society is in feast and famine and that input, out, uh, insulin output needs to be regulated. Uh, in the 21st century, among indigenous peoples in Canada and for the most part in the United States, we do not experience famine. We don't have famine. We don't have hungry people for the most part. Unfortunately, the food that's being given and that people are consuming uh, is less than healthy and less than conducive to this. So we're always eating the things that we eat fill our bellies and constantly fed bellies, full bellies, expanding bellies create a problem. You can only put so much gasoline into the car. Heredity is of course the other factor and as we look at the numbers here when both parents are at 70, have di had high diabetes and children are at 75 percent risk of that our problem that we face in community is that we often, in the last 20 years, and it still continues to this day, have people, young people, who will say, well, my mother and father have diabetes, my kukum or my duda have diabetes, all my aunties and uncles have diabetes, I'm going to get diabetes. Us Indians, we get diabetes. So, you know, we give up. We give up. And that compounds the already existing situations and problems that we face with as a third world oppressed people in a first world country that complicates the situation. And I am purposely putting this, this political slant and, and, and um, anti-colonialist slant on this in this presentation because, um, because we can do the clinical stuff. I mean, you're gonna read that, you can go read that, that stuff in books. But when you want to hear a presentation of what our first person experience is about, we need to get this across, especially with people who are in the health field, who are becoming doctors, who will be working uh, with peoples from our communities, uh, and who will be working with all human beings who need to, to have that um, medical sensitivity to our cultures and our ways and understanding our histories in, in some ways so that when that dialogue between doctor and patient takes place, that there's that that awareness and that sensitivity on the part of, of physicians because that goes farther in the patient receiving what the message that you're trying to get across. Okay, so it's, it's the, 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 the harsh tone maybe of some of my presentation isn't about trying to put anybody down but of making sure that part the participants in this uh, lecture series are understanding uh, the situation from where we come from, from where we sit. Okay, so I have to also make that. Yes, sir. Question there in Niagara. Hi. Hi. Uh, you said that the 
Yes. No, my understanding is that that's a, that's a general uh, physiological um, fact. That, that's, that's the biological hereditary fact, as I've been told by the medical people through the workshops I've attended over the years. And a couple of people in the room here are nodding their heads, so I'm feeling a little bit confident that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Please. I don't think, I don't know if it's necessarily a fate thing, but more of maybe of a fatalistic mm -hmm. perspective of looking at the situation. If everybody in my family has diabetes, I'm going to get diabetes too. So I'm not going to put the effort into trying to fight it because I, no matter what I do, I'll get it anyways. And, and I think that's more symptomatic of, of people who come from an oppressed society, that there's social oppression, spiritual oppression, uh, economic oppression that's gone on. Um, you know, over, over the you know, last couple of hundred years to a hundred years, depending when contact was made. Okay, does that answer your question, sir? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, um, what we can control then, talking about the risk factors, what we can control, what we have the power over is this beautiful gift that was given to us by the creator or through creation or whatever belief system we have that we come here on earth for this limited time period. This is our vehicle. And what we know is that the main physiological cause of diabetes is obesity, carrying more weight than is healthy. That weight is in the front of the, uh, the body, particularly that, um, that fat that's inside, the, the inner layer of fat. I'm showing you all my medical training here, folks. Uh, that's the big words that I know. Um, visceral fat? Wow! Maybe I should get a doctor's degree. Da can, can we talk, Danielle? Thank you. Okay. It's the percentage of obesity. It's the amount of time that we're obese. And so, of course, the, the, the big problem is when we're seeing preschool age children and we're seeing little children going into grade one and grade two, and they're already, you know, hefty. Real, you know, and, and we see more and more of it. I mean, it's on the papers and, and in the news all the time now, the obesity crisis. We know what's being set up because heavier children will become heavier, youth will become heavier adults for the most part. It becomes kind of a norm. And, and so it becomes a crisis. It's, it's, it's almost, uh, back to your question, uh, sir, um, it almost becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy then, mm -hmm. in a way. You know, um, not only do I have no, you know, um, no hope in the future, but I will make sure that my children don't have any hope in the future too, and we're just going to feed them and give them what they want and do what they want, uh, et cetera. My editorial, sorry. Uh, and where does the obesity come from? Well, basically we know the change in eating habits over time. Uh, we've moved to a high fat diet, high salt, high sugar, low in fiber, physical activity we have. Uh, a decreased um, uh, active lifestyle uh, with, the, with the onset of technology because of economics. Uh, and, uh, and so now the, the uh, computer games companies come up with Wii and things like that. So yes, we want you to play the computer and use the technology, but now we're going to get you bowling and playing golf and dance and do all those kinds of things as well. So that shows us that, yeah, there are hopes, but most of, the, most of our world is, is falling into being behind desks, being sedentary in the things that we do. And we don't have to travel because we don't have to travel for communication anymore.